John chapter 3, verse 16 says that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave us his son. And in a similar way, I want to encourage you to continue to give back to the Lord, to take time to consider what it is that he has given you, not just in Jesus, but in all that you have, and to release some of that back into his kingdom and support the ministry that we have here at Valley View Christian Church specifically. We're grateful for your generosity, and we believe that as you open your hands and release what it is that God has given you, that you open yourself up to receive from him some incredible things as well. As I said, God has given us some amazing things, not just his son, but he's also given us all of creation. Specifically, one of the most amazing things in creation that God has given us are the redwood trees. I don't know if you've been to visit one of these trees, but they're absolutely massive. They're hundreds of years old, some of them, and they tower over people. If you look at those redwood trees, you might have the misconception that they're absolutely indestructible, that there's nothing that could take them down short of maybe a bulldozer, that there's nothing that could actually hurt a redwood tree. But if you were to look into the tree, take a chainsaw inside of it, you would see rings that are there. And these rings, they represent different things. They might represent a season of drought. They might represent a season in which there was a fire. They might represent a season in which there was a great flood. They might represent a season of even great growth. As you look at these rings, you can see some of the trials and tribulations that these great trees have gone through. I think that if you were to cut through your life, you'd probably see something very similar. You'd see a ring maybe where you were abused as a child. You would see a ring where there was a parent who was absent. You would see a ring for the divorce that you went through. You would see a ring for the bankruptcy that you had to deal with. And now in our day that we are dealing with, the things that we are dealing with in our day just now, we will one day see a ring where We had to go through this virus that is consuming not just our lives, but is consuming our entire world. And it's causing quite a bit of suffering. It's causing some pain. It's causing us to go through things that are hard to understand. And so what are we supposed to do with all of this? Well, one thing that we do need to understand is that pain is not something that God wishes for us necessarily. The Bible says it this way in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 33, that God does not willingly bring affliction or grief to his children, to the children of men. And so why is it then that we struggle and we have to go through suffering and we have to go through pain, we have to go through these trials? Why is it that we have these rings that are in many ways going to define our lives? Well, there are a few different reasons, a few different answers that we can come up with for why it is that we suffer. One reason that we go through suffering is that it's simply the result of our own sin. Let's just be honest. There are mistakes that we make in life, and there are consequences as a result of those particular mistakes. Now, if you lie, you probably will lose your job. If you steal, you may end up in jail. If you overeat, then you're probably going to end up incredibly unhealthy. It's not because God wanted you to be unhealthy. It's not because God wanted you to be unemployed. It's not because God wanted you to lose your job. It's because you and me, we make decisions that aren't always the best decisions to make. Another reason that we go through suffering in life is because of other people's sin. I heard someone once say that 95% of the problems we deal with in this world are because of the choices that other people make. Now, there's no study that would back that up, but it is to say that that is a valid point that is being made. That often the trials we go through in life are the result of other people's sin. The reason that you have something stolen from you isn't because of you necessarily. It's probably because... Somebody stole something from you and they made a bad decision. If somebody is yelling at you, it's probably not your fault. It's probably their fault that they're losing control of their temper, their emotions. Someone I've even heard say that with all of the people in the world, 
we have enough food to feed everyone with at least 2,000 calories a day. And yet we still have many people who are starving. Well, one of the reasons for that is because of our own greed, our selfishness. Another reason that we go through suffering in this life is because of satanic attack. The Bible is very clear that we have a force for good that is for us and a force for evil that is against us. But the Bible also makes it clear that if God is for us, it doesn't matter who is against us. In the book of Job, we find Job going through incredible suffering. He has to go through the challenges of losing a business. He loses his family. He loses his health. And why did all of it happen? Was it the result of his bad choices, his sin? Was it the result of someone else's sin? No. It was the result of satanic attack. In 2 Corinthians, Paul repeatedly says that the reason that he has to go through many of the trials that he has to go through is because Satan is against him. One of the main reasons that we go through problems in this world is because of what's known as spiritual warfare. It's a reality in the age in which we live. Another reason that we go through suffering is because we live in a fallen world. This virus that we are dealing with today, and really for the weeks, maybe even months to come, is because we live in a fallen world. That's why there are things like AIDS, and that's why there are tsunamis that take place and there are earthquakes and there are forest fires. That's why these types of natural disasters are all around us and these diseases that come up through our world. It's because we are in a fallen place that is not as it should be. If you imagine it like this, when God created everything, he said it was good. And then he ultimately says it's very good. Sin was still, the potential for sin was still there but it had yet to make it into creation. Imagine that the AIDS virus was on your skin. It wouldn't be in you. You wouldn't necessarily be infected by it, but if it gets on to an area that is open, if there is a cut into your skin, immediately that is going to infect you. In a similar way, when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, They cut into creation as they disobeyed God and allowed sin to infect it. And so because of that, there are things that this world throws at us because this world isn't the way that it's supposed to be. And it knows that. And that's why Romans 8 says that all of creation groans. It groans for the day when things will be as they were meant to be. And so how is it that we are supposed to respond to this? You see, I don't think that the question to ask is, why, God, are you allowing this to happen? I think the question for us to really ask is, God, how would you like me to respond to what it is that has happened? How are we supposed to make sense of what is happening around us? And what are our responses supposed to be to that? Well, a great example of someone who responded correctly to tragedy is a man named Joseph in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us that he was the favorite of his father, Jacob, in comparison to all of his other brothers. He was the favorite of them, and Jacob didn't hide it. And it was so bad, in fact, the favoritism that Jacob showed Joseph, that the Bible tells us this, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. His brothers were jealous of him. Now, in this particular day, There were many different things that someone could do, but if you felt this away, you would probably maybe give someone the silent treatment. Perhaps you might make up a lie about them. Maybe you would even give them some bad goat milk and cause them to get sick. You'd put their head, worst case scenario, some big brothers might put your head in the toilet or the cistern, if you would, in this particular time. But these brothers allowed their emotions to get the best of them. And granted, Joseph was a bit immature, for sure a little prideful. He said some things that he shouldn't have said. He talked about how they were going to bow down to him one day. And it was all the brothers could handle. And so what do they do? They sell him off into slavery. And it's there that he deals with all kinds of temptations, trials, challenges, 
accusations thrown at him. And yet, it never gets the best of him. It's interesting that even as he goes through these different things, his story reminds us repeatedly of this. The Lord was with him. I wrote in my Bible some time ago next to this verse. As I was examining Joseph's circumstances, he's been imprisoned, he's a slave, he's had lies and accusations lobbed against him that were not true. I wrote next to this verse, so what? And what does it matter if God's with you when you still have to go through these different trials and these different tribulations and you have to suffer the way that Joseph suffered? Well, in this case, there was a good outcome. In fact, what would end up happening is that Joseph, through the decision of his brothers, Joseph would be led into Egypt. And at that particular point, he would find himself somehow in the presence of the most powerful person in the world, the Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a dream. He didn't understand it. And Joseph said, this is what the dream means. There's going to be seven years of plenty. And then there's going to be seven years of famine. And you have to prepare for this. And Pharaoh sees the potential. He sees the upside in Joseph. And so he gives him authority and responsibility to come up with a a solution to this problem that they were going to face. And with that, Joseph would begin to rise in power. And when the famine struck, all of the nations around Egypt would come come to them asking for grain. And so one day, Joseph, he would see his brothers walking towards him. And there they bowed before him, as he once said they would. And now that prophecy was fulfilled in that moment. And Joseph had a choice of how he would handle that situation. That these brothers of him, who had caused him to lose years of his life, who had caused him to miss out on the twilight of his father's life, these men who had caused him so much pain, sold him off into slavery, was that the moment when he would get even? Not Joseph. Instead, Joseph would help his brothers. He would reveal himself to them. And when they thought that Joseph was going to get back at them, this is what Joseph said. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for the good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And the lesson that we learn from this is that when things around us just seem so out of control, And there's things that are happening to us that we can't seem to stop. Is that maybe God is up to something that we just can't quite see. We can't quite make sense of yet. But he is faithful and he will do more with that than we could, with that pain that we're going through, that suffering that we're dealing with, than we could ever imagine doing with in the calm, smooth seasons of life. I've found that often it's these exciting, exhilarating challenges that we go through. Those are the times that we look back on with great pride and with peace for what it is that God does with those seasons. It seems as though we might be in one of those seasons right now. We're in a bit of a white water time with each of our lives, our families, our companies, our country, our world even. When I was in South Dakota a few years back, I did some canoeing there through the Badlands. One of the things that they teach you when you're canoeing is there's a tendency when you hit the white waters, and canoes aren't necessarily designed to deal with rough white waters, but you still go through some, that when you're going through these white waters, there's a tendency for the canoe to begin to wobble. And there's a natural reaction on our part to grab the side of the canoe. But what the guides will teach you is, if you grab the side of the canoe, what will happen is you'll overcompensate. And the more control you attempt to have, the more out of control the canoe is. And even though everything around you is out of control, what they teach you to do is this, is don't lean into your natural reaction of fear and overreaction to grab and gain control. Instead, what they tell you to do is this is to get down on your knees in the middle of the canoe as low as you can go. To don't give in to the temptation to grab to the sides, 
but instead, as you place as much weight as you possibly can down on your knees, that the canoe calms. And even though what is around it is absolutely out of control, what is happening inside of that canoe calms down even more. And friends, that's the challenge that I have for you as we go through this great trial. It's not to attempt to white-knuckle the sides of every area of your life, but to maybe spend a little bit more time pressing down on your knees and giving God the situations that you're dealing with. The Bible promises us this, that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world, not us. We won't overcome these challenges. They're too great. They're too troublesome. It's too crazy what's going on around us. But if we can just get on our knees and lean into him, he has promised that he will take that from us and guide us through those rough waters. Psalm chapter 55 says these words, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. And friends, as we go through this tough season that is ahead of us, no doubt about it, let us persevere in this time. Let us cast our cares on the Lord. And let us, like Joseph, come to find the many people that we can help in our lives, in this world, because there are many who are hurting. There are many who need hope. And you, if you have that hope in Jesus Christ, share it with others and show them that you have a God who is one that can be trusted, who is one who loves you, who is one who gave his son to you because he didn't want to be apart from you, but he wanted to be with you just like he was with Joseph. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the hope that we have in Christ. And Father, may we lean into you in these difficult times. Help us to be gracious to one another as we are, so many of us are on edge. And Father, help us above all else to trust that you are in control. And Lord, may we give all of this to you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.